Hi church, it's good to see you again as we continue our study of the Joseph story. In our last session, we looked at Genesis 37 through to 40, where both Joseph and Judah descended away from their family. The reasons were very different. Joseph's brothers had sold him into slavery in Egypt. They tricked their father into thinking that he was dead. Judah, on the other hand, chose to leave the family and live for many years among the Canaanites. In a sense, he became like the Canaanites by acting in ways that dishonored the Lord and by raising children who were evil in the eyes of the Lord. Tamar tricked Judah, and at the lowest point of Judah's descent into a Canaanite lifestyle, he comes to the realization that Tamar, no matter how immoral she has acted, is more righteous than Judah. Instead of moving forward with his plan to have Tamar killed and covering it up, he brings her and their children into his family. From this point forward, the story places Judah back with the Israelite family, no longer living like a Canaanite, but living like an Israelite. Joseph's descent continued all the way through the end of chapter 40. First, he was a slave to the Egyptian official Potiphar. Unlike Judah, Joseph maintained his moral purity despite an attempted rape by Potiphar's wife. Having no power in the face of her accusations, Potiphar sent him from slavery in an officer's house to imprisonment in the Pharaoh's prison. But throughout Genesis 39, the chapter tells us time and again that the Lord was with Joseph even as his situation got worse. In the prison, Joseph interpreted two dreams for two of Pharaoh's officials. In response, he begged one of them to plead his case before Pharaoh. Maybe the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, could raise him from his virtual death. But at the end of chapter 40, Joseph remains a forgotten prisoner with little hope for release. What will happen next? Well, let's continue to look at the biblical text and see. Today we will look at chapters 41 through to 45. We will consider chapter 41 and the change it brings to Joseph, as well as to his role within the plot. We will then look at some of the major themes of Genesis 42 to 45, as the story highlights the family conflict. In Genesis 41, things immediately start to change. The story introduces a new character who has been behind the scenes, Pharaoh. He's been mentioned by other characters, but now only, now only uh, he directly enters the story. Pharaoh has a dream. Pharaoh's magicians, Pharaoh's wise men can't interpret it. You see, in ancient Egypt... The Pharaoh's wise men and astrologers and magicians had books that they would use to interpret dreams. If there were certain types of animals, it meant certain types of things. But they aren't able to interpret this dream. And it's at this point that the cupbearer remembers how Joseph had interpreted his dream and has Joseph brought before Pharaoh. Before, Fa or before Joseph comes to appear before Pharaoh, notice that Joseph changes his clothes and shaves. Excuse me. Israelite men took pride in their beards, and they actually considered it shameful to shave. But Joseph shaves. He's going to use this opportunity. Joseph listens to the dream of Pharaoh, 
and then interprets it in a way that the Pharaoh approves. The dream prophesied a period of abundance followed by a period of famine. In response to these dreams, Joseph goes beyond an interpretation and actually suggests a plan for how Pharaoh and Egypt can survive this famine. He suggests that Pharaoh can appoint a wise man to oversee storehouses, which could provide food for the famine to come. Now, Joseph knows that all of Egypt's wise men have just failed in interpreting Pharaoh's dream. Joseph alone was able to interpret it. This seems like a subtle attempt to persuade Pharaoh that Joseph should lead the project. Pharaoh agrees. This seems like a good plan. He asks whether they can find anyone with a divine spirit or the spirit of the gods in them like Joseph. Now, I do want to point out some translations will say that who can find someone with God's spirit in them in chapter 41, verse 38, and it will even capitalize God in verse 39. The ESV goes further and capitalizes both spirit and God, implying that Pharaoh is referring to the Holy Spirit. I think this is incorrect. Clearly, Pharaoh is not referring to the Holy Spirit. Pharaoh was a pagan. Pharaoh worshipped many gods. And so these phrases are better translated as a spirit of the gods, or whenever he says, a god has revealed this to you. Pharaoh did not begin worshiping the god of the Israelites. That's clear from the rest of the book. While well, Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge, he gives him a chariot to ride upon. He clothes him in royal clothing. He renames him Zaphanath Paneah. The exact meaning of this name remains unclear, but the majority view is that it means the God speaks and lives. Pharaoh takes Joseph and marries him into an Egyptian priestly family. He gives Joseph absolute authority in Egypt, second only to his own authority. Now, Joseph was 30 years old at this point. Joseph does what the dream foretold and prepares for the famine to come. Now, at this point, many of us would stop and say, wow, God has truly turned Joseph's life around. This is clearly the work of God. But before we jump to that conclusion, let me present some counter evidence that should at least make us think twice before we come to that conclusion. First, notice that as Joseph's life got worse in Genesis 39, as he went from slavery to imprisonment, the Bible kept telling us that the Lord, using the covenantal name of God, Yahweh, was with Joseph. But the Bible never mentions Yahweh during Joseph's rise to power in Egypt. It never mentions Yahweh during his conflict with the brothers. Second, Joseph marries into an Egyptian family. But Moses keeps reminding us that it is a pagan family. Every time that Joseph's wife, Asenath, is mentioned, Genesis tells us that she is the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On. In other words, Joseph is now the son-in-law of the high priest at Egypt's main temple in Heliopolis. Nothing in the passage makes us think that Joseph resisted or objected to either being given a pagan name or being married into a pagan family. Third, if we assume that the original readers, 
of Genesis were those who had been enslaved in Egypt, or at least descendants of those who were enslaved in Egypt, how would they have interpreted this depiction of Joseph? As he rides on a chariot and people bow before him shouting, make way or bend the knee. Where do you think the former Israelite slaves see themselves in this story? They're the ones being made to bow before the Egyptian Lord. Fourth, in Genesis 41 verses 50 through to 52, we read about Joseph and Asenath having two sons. The first is named Manasseh. Joseph's reason for this name is that, quote, God has made me forget all of my hardship and my father's house, end quote. But his father is Jacob. His father is Israel himself. Would the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob truly cause him to forget Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? He names the other son Ephraim because, quote, God has made me bear fruit in the land of my oppression, end quote. The verb for bearing fruit looks all the way back to Genesis 1. When God blessed Jacob, his father, in Genesis 35 verse 11 and told him to be fruitful and multiply, he immediately said to him, quote, a nation, indeed an assembly of nations will come from you, end quote. There is a clear association between fruitfulness, the nation of Israel, and the promised land. But Joseph isn't in the promised land. He's saying that God has blessed him away from the family outside of the promised land. How would an Israelite think of that? Fifth, and finally, the ancient rabbis were significantly bothered by Joseph's behavior in this passage. Particularly, Joseph knows that a famine is coming and does absolutely nothing to save his father and his brothers. You can explain his refusal to save most of his brothers as payback for their having sold him into slavery. But can you explain his refusal to even contact Jacob, his father, or Benjamin, his younger son? Now, there are actually many more reasons than these, but those should be enough to make you at least question whether or not we should interpret Joseph's rise positively. God certainly uses the rise of Joseph to preserve his people. But does God approve of how Joseph becomes like an Egyptian or how Joseph neglects his people? We will address that question more in the final session as well. Well, Genesis 41 ends with Joseph selling the stored grain back to the Egyptians once the famine begins. It also notes that every land came to Joseph to purchase grain because everyone was suffering. And that leads us to the next section. Genesis 42 begins with Jacob, the patriarch of the family. By some means of which we aren't told, he learns that there is grain being sold in Egypt. Jacob's words in response to this situation portray the brothers as incompetent. Why do they keep standing around doing nothing? And so he sends his sons down to Egypt to find grain, but keeps Benjamin back home. When the brothers arrive in Egypt, Joseph immediately recognizes them. But they can no longer recognize Joseph. Remember in Genesis 37, they could recognize Joseph from a long ways away. But here they can no longer recognize him. Why not? Well, first they assume that this man is an Egyptian lord. He speaks to them through an interpreter. He dresses and acts like an Egyptian. He holds the power of an Egyptian ruler. 
After all, they assume that Joseph is enslaved or dead. When they ask this Egyptian lord to buy food from him, he accuses them of being spies. Now, in ancient Egypt, even the accusation of being a spy would deserve the death penalty. So Joseph is threatening to put them to death. He accuses them. He threatens them. In this section, he even swears by the life of Pharaoh, something that would have been considered a pagan action. They insist that they are there to buy food. So Joseph decides to give them a test. He says he will imprison them unless they bring back their youngest brother. Why does Joseph test them? What do you think he's trying to see from them? Well, he does imprison them. And then at a later point, he takes their brother Simeon out before them and binds him in front of them. You know, some people look at this story and see the cruel and harsh ways that Joseph treats his brothers, and they justify it by saying that he's simply trying to prompt his brothers to repentance. But the Bible never gives us a reason, and the book of Genesis actually often teaches that retributive justice like that isn't how people should act. It's just as possible that Joseph wants to use his new power simply to punish them for all the pain that they caused him. Even though his present situation seems prosperous, he still describes his previous life as one of affliction. He still weeps when confronted with what seems like repentance on the part of the brothers. In chapter 42, verse 21, the brothers believe that God is using this Egyptian Lord to pay them back for the wrongs that they did to their brother. Joseph hears them. Reuben suggests that this is how God will account of what they did to Joseph. Now, Joseph doesn't deny them at this point. Instead, he leaves the room and weeps. But when he returns, he takes Simeon, their brother, and binds him in front of them to put him in prison while he sends them off to bring back their youngest brother. Joseph had been wrongfully enslaved in Egypt and wrongfully put in prison by Potiphar. And now he's unjustly putting his brother Simeon in prison as well. As the brothers are sent home, one of them opens up his sack and finds that the money used to buy the grain was still in his sack. The brothers do not interpret this as God's blessing, but a curse. They assume that the Egyptian Lord who spoke harshly to them will now accuse them of stealing money. This is a certain death sentence. They actually interpret this as God's punishment, and they ask, quote, What has God done to us? It's unclear from the narrative itself why Joseph put the money back into their sacks. There are three interpretations that are often given. First, some scholars assume that Joseph is trying to trap them. Now, if they return to Egypt, he will have every right to arrest them and kill them. Second, some scholars assume that Joseph was trying to care for them and to provide for their father, not only giving them grain, but also returning their money to them as well. Third, some scholars suggest that Joseph was doing this to make them wonder where the money came from and maybe conclude, after thinking about it, that the Egyptian lord was actually Joseph. Scholars are actually uncertain on the reason the text doesn't say. I tend to think that Joseph did it subconsciously to help out his family, even if it ultimately caused them to fear him more and actually brought shame and fear to their father. In response to this situation, Reuben, the eldest son, remember the one who should hold all of the honor and respect of the family, he says to their father Jacob, he says, If you entrust Benjamin with him to take him down to Egypt, 
then, and then if he's unable to bring Benjamin back, he tells Jacob, go ahead and kill my two sons. Think about this logic. Jacob has already lost two sons. Joseph, Simeon, who is still in prison, and possibly Benjamin in this scenario. So Reuben's suggestion is that if he's unable to bring Benjamin back, he will suffer the same type of pain as well. Why is this a good solution? In this scenario, Reuben lives, but five people are lost. Joseph, Simeon, Benjamin, and Reuben's two sons. Jacob wisely rejects this pointless plan. Instead, they leave Simeon in prison for who knows how long and try to survive on the grain that they have purchased. Now, the brothers had only brought back a limited amount of grain. As the famine persisted, the family ran out of food again and Jacob once again sent them to Egypt to purchase food. This whole time, Simeon remained in an Egyptian prison under Joseph's rule. At this point, Judah reminds Jacob that the Egyptian lord, Joseph, had told them not to return to Egypt without Benjamin. Judah makes a very different proposal to Jacob than his elder brother Reuben had made, though. He doesn't offer up his sons like Reuben did. Remember, after all, that Judah has had two sons through Tamar, who are two sons through his Canaanite wife who have died. He knows the feeling. He also does have two sons of his own through Tamar, Perez and Zerah, as well as Shela, who if he wanted to offer up a foolish plot like Reuben, he could do the same. But he doesn't do that. Judah says that he himself will be the pledge if they do not return. Think of what a change this is from Judah's characterization in Genesis 37 and 38. In those passages, he places himself above others. But here, he places the family above himself. So Jacob sends them off with a number of gifts. They go down to Egypt. They are certainly fearful. They don't know that Joseph had ordered for this money to be put back into their sacks and had assumed that God had placed it there as a curse. Who knows what will happen when they arrive? They certainly feared that the Egyptian ruler might imprison them or kill them. But when they arrive, they are welcomed by Joseph's servant. The servant tells them not to fear because God had received the money for the grain that they had purchased and that their, or that he had received the money for the grain that they had purchased and that their God had put the money back in their sacks. Joseph's servant even releases Simeon for them. When Joseph arrives, they all bow down to the ground before Joseph. This certainly fulfills Joseph's first dream. It still doesn't fulfill the second dream because neither Jacob nor his mother are bowing before him. But it certainly fulfills the first dream. Now, think about this. Joseph didn't know that they had come. <laughs> there was no WhatsApp. They couldn't, you know, message down to Joseph's servant and say, Hey, we're coming down to buy grain. Nobody knew, because Joseph's servant didn't know this was his family, nobody knew that this was his family except Joseph. He would have certainly been surprised. And so he immediately asks about their father's health. When he sees his brother Benjamin, he rushes out of the room and weeps. I think that Joseph is clearly torn about how to handle the situation, and it's causing these emotional responses. He's not yet ready to reveal himself, but he clearly loves his father and Benjamin, despite his continued resentment toward the other brothers. Now, it's interesting to think how we might respond in Joseph's situation. What would you do? Would you reveal yourself yet to the brothers? 
Well, what Joseph does is he comes up with a plan to trap Benjamin for himself and send everyone else back to their father. He sends off the brothers with grain once again, but this time doesn't plant money in the bag. Instead, he plants his special diviner's cup into the sack of Benjamin. Now, this was a pagan item by which rulers in Egypt would uh, do divination, something that later Israelite law actually condemned to death. But Joseph says, you know, don't you know that I can do the things of God? And he plants this diviner's cup in Benjamin's bag. So, what happens? Well, he sends, uh, after they... After the brothers go off and they find, um, or they, they, they are found out to have the diviner's cup in their bags as Joseph sends people after them to capture them, well, that's what they do. They capture them, they bring them back to Egypt, and he plans to keep Benjamin with him. At this point, everything seems to be going according to plan. He has trapped Benjamin in this supposed crime that he set up, And he'll be able to send off his brothers, never to deal with them again, send them back to their father, and keep Benjamin to himself. But once again, Judah speaks up. Just as he offered himself as a pledge to Jacob, he offers himself as a substitute for Benjamin. He tells Joseph that he's offering himself for the sake of their father. He would rather suffer than to allow their father to suffer anymore. It's at this point that Joseph breaks. He sends off the servants. He weeps. He reveals himself to his brothers. Interestingly, they don't know how to respond. They don't say a word. They still fear him. Joseph lets them know that five more years of the famine remain, and he will provide for them. When Pharaoh finds out that this is Joseph's family, Pharaoh promises to provide for the family. But he promises to provide for them outside of the promised land. Bring them down to Egypt. Here, I can care for them. They don't need any of their things from Egypt. He even tells them to leave their things in Egypt. You have to wonder what they thought about this. They would have food, they would have survival, they would have some amount of wealth and authority through Joseph. But is this where they are supposed to be? I think we're supposed to ask this question. Furthermore, God had told Abraham, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. I wonder if the family would have wondered if this was the time of their affliction. Well, we will have to pick up on those questions in our next session, where we consider Genesis 46 through to 50, the end of the book of Genesis. May the Lord bless your study of his word.